Yeah. Introducing Braden Rogers. Pleasure to meet you. Chief Customer Officer at Ireland. How are you, mate? I'm doing great. I'm doing great, sir. How about you? I'm all right, man. All right. Thank you there. Yeah, <laughs> all good. All good. Good to see you. Good to see you as well. So, hot off the press, 175 million, 3 billion valuation. Is that right? You know, very fortunate right now. So, we uh, yeah. we can claim a lot of great customers who, uh, who backed us and made it possible. So, uh, great you know, time. we just to keep waking up every day and want to make sure we earn that every day. So, yeah, love it. Love it. Braden, with all my guests, I like to sort of take it right back to where it all began and how you got into the industry. Yeah, you know, take it all the way back to a long time ago, 1997. So I was uh, working in a small shop in Birmingham, Alabama and started a website with a gentleman, started a uh, website called rootshell.com. So we published white hat exploits before it was even popular to do so. So we, uh, we, we wrote many of the exploits and we published stuff from others and we uh, just kind of started my interest in it. And then over the years, I've, I've been through many companies, through companies like McAfee and Blue Coat and Symantec on the executive teams, and then uh, obviously in the island now to do something quite different than I've done very previously. So. Yeah, I yeah, love it. So some big roles so like Symantec. So you're sort of like a bit of product and marketing, the sales engineering. Is that right? What were some of the roles you were in? Yeah, it's a, you know my root, my first role when I was doing the the root shell thing years ago, I was a C developer, but yeah. I, I quickly found that I just enjoyed being with with, with people like yourself, spending time talking about technology. And, I just found a career passion for sales engineering and uh, quickly advanced the ranks and just, uh, you know, again, just started, uh, you know, advancing through the sales engineering organizations that I've worked in and sort of running global teams and uh, just continue, find, continue with that passion. But what was interesting years ago, we had uh, several leaders who came up with a brilliant idea. It wasn't my idea, it was let's take product marketing, who builds all the assets and the messaging. And unfortunately, oftentimes is, you know, a couple degrees separated from what's happening in the field. Let's bring them together with sales engineering. And so we, we, we meshed those two orgs together and brought part product marketers straight to the tip of the spear. And uh, it's been a really wonderful marriage for many years over several companies, and then that continues on in the island today. There's been a couple of acquisitions in your career as well, right? Yeah, we've been fortunate. That's, uh, you know, many, many years ago back at McAfee, being a part of the acquisition teams on several small tuck ins, but, uh, you know, over the years through the Blue Code acquisition through Symantec, which was pretty significant, and I learned a lot in that process. And then obviously in Symantec doing a number of different acquisitions, and one of the most meaningful ones was uh, an acquisition we made for remote browser isolation yep. through one of our co-founders' companies that we, you know, pulled into the Blue Coat portfolio, and uh, you know, the rest is history. That's how we, uh, you know, learned a lot, got to know each other, and then uh, years later, he came up with a brilliant idea to start an Island. So yeah, okay. I was going to ask, how did you guys meet? Just obviously, the next big firms now obviously started up. So was it was it Dan? A quick one here from Oliver, one of the co-founders of Aspiron Search. Our Cyberbytes podcast showcases the security ecosystem's most exciting companies, but we do much more. Our talent solutions give security vendors the competitive advantage by building high-performing go-to-market and technical teams globally. If you're looking for your next role or need to hire the best talent in this competitive market, then reach out to us directly via our info at email in the show notes. Let's get back to it. Indeed. Uh, well, so I work for uh, Mike Fay, yeah, yeah. who's our CEO at Island. I worked for Mike for about 17 years. Been a, been a great, great friend and a great partner for many years through through the journeys of, of five companies together, and uh, we got to know Dan, you know, at Symantec when we acquired his firm, and uh, just realized what a great talent Dan was. And then you know we kind of went our separate ways for a few years, and Dan had this this brilliant idea. He'd been germinating, and he brought it to Mike, and uh, you know the rest is history. That's which where we are right now. So yeah. it's, it's been a really wonderful journey. Brilliant. What's your role with Ida now then? So I own a number of different functions. Essentially, as chief customer officer. Anything that's technical that happens in the field is in my world. So that would be the world of pre-sales, the deployment work, customer success, my support of the product, and even, as we talked about a moment ago, product marketing as well. So I get the opportunity to spend time doing you know, the things I've always loved doing, but building it from scratch, which has been really fun. In many of the places I've been before, I took over existing resources, existing teams, maybe existing process, some of the things that, you know, the kind of ground in the way they'd done it before. It was kind of hard to transform some of those things, but it's been fun building from scratch. Yeah. In terms of actually Ireland as a business, what are you guys up to? Wow. Uh, you know, I, I look around the, the world of customers we're working in and we've been just, I, I count my blessings every day. We wake up and we get to do some very special work with incredibly special people. And uh, that means the customers that are some of the most discerning brains on the planet. They, you know, these are these are hard nuts. These are people that are, you know, they've got difficult environments, they've got difficult challenges. And, uh, you know, every day we get to wake up and solve difficult things for them that have been very evasive for them for 
10, 20 years. And uh, we, we found a really unique way to do it elegantly. And uh, I think, you know, the fun part is I get to work with really smart people. They challenge us in a great way. They've also pressure tested our technology in a unique way over almost four years now at this point. And, uh, you know, we, for the, for the age we are as a company, it's really interesting. We almost don't deserve the success. We've been just very fortunate. Like I say, we're blessed and you don't take it for granted every day. You wake up every day trying to earn it, but, uh, you know, you know, fingers crossed it continues on that path. So, yeah, look, great founding team, great technology, great market. I think it's not just fortunate. So obviously we've got the, uh, the market, we've got the team, you come in, was it top 10? How many fortune companies have, have we got under you? Man, so it's a lot. You know, I don't know what the percentage, I think it's 20 to 30% now at this point, but it's, uh, and again, these are very discerning eyes. These are people that, you know, they've seen a lot of technologies come and go. They come to this show, for example, and you see, you know, thousands of vendors on the floor, it feels like. And, uh, you know, they, they've, they've shown preference to spend a lot of time with us. Yeah. And uh, I think a lot of that goes to the core of the tech. You know, there's a lot of things that have factored into why we are where we are. You know, the investors have been great to us. We've got great talent on our teams, but the core tech is what is the draw for everybody. And that includes the customers and again, it just solves very unique challenges that have been out of their reach for many years. So yeah, what are some of the key features of, of the technology? Well, if you think about, first of all, what makes the, the, the technology possible is its unique physical position. So its physical position, we call it the last mile. The last mile because you think about the, as a user goes to a destination on the internet, like obviously their browser, the content traverses the internet, across many hops, many pieces of technology in the process. And that last mile before data hits the glass of the screen is the browser's presentation layer. So we built unique mechanics into that last mile that, that govern the experience. So what that does is that, that kind of lets the genie out of the bottle with some very unique controls. So capabilities to do things like redacting data in key applications. Um, you know, that's been very difficult for many years, just basic data redaction. But it's a perfect example of the manifestation of, of living at that presentation layer that it's quite difficult otherwise. But you know, redacting data or Layering unique workflows over applications, you know, in an example of redaction, I might do a soft redaction where I let the user, if they're in the right role, the right contextual situation, unredact data and uh, go through an authorization process, maybe a step up authentication. You know, governing how copy and paste works at the right time, but preventing its abuse at the wrong time. And how uh, screenshots work at the right time, and again, preventing their abuse at the wrong time. But a whole series of unique things because you get to live at that presentation layer. And that, so back to your question about the capabilities, just everything about it's physically unique because when you get to live at that unique physical position, nobody's ever really lived there before. And so it opens up unique things from control, from audit, from workflows, from productivity for end users. So it's not just about cybersecurity, which is great about the show, mm -hmm. but it's also about the user experience and giving the user a great experience in a more productive environment to work in. Yeah, typically when you've got increased security, productivity decreases, how are you able to keep the productivity? Well, you know, there's been this phrase for years, secure by design. People have been talking about it for years. And unfortunately, secure by design is often used incorrectly because what we're doing is we're bolting things on around the experience. So the user experience is usually abstracted away from the actual mechanics of protecting the resources. And we're fortunate because we were able to build those things in. So as you think about, you know, building the, the services natively into the browser itself, they're built natively into the experience. The, the user themselves sees a browser. It's a very familiar experience. We don't have to train them to use it. But what happens is, as they engage the, uh, the, the applications and the data for, for the applications underneath the covers, um, the mechanics of the browser can shepherd them very, uh, Customer use the word ambiently, use ambient security. I love that phrase because, it, you know, ambient lighting, it, it, it's kind of soft. It, you know, it's, it's not the sharp edge customers have felt for many years. And so we can sh steer the user to the appropriate areas that, are, that are, are needed for their usage. Perfect example, generative AI. The sharp edge that everybody's using right now is a big block page. You can't go there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a right time and a wrong time to use those things, but a lot of orgs, their instant knee-jerk reaction is to pull those things back away from users because they have no choice. Because the controls they have, they don't have the, the delicacy and the dexterity to be able to be applied in the right way. For us, it's perfect because when the user tries to go to some sort of generative, generative AI model, mm -hmm. I can ensure that, you know what, we shepherd them to the appropriate sanction place very cleanly. And by the way, ensure that the appropriate data controls are just naturally inserted into the workflows for the users. So the user gets a great experience. 
the practitioners that are trying to adopt generative AI, they get their desires met for a competitive edge, but the cyber teams also win in that process as well. Yeah, there's been some obviously some big, big breaches and hacks recently and over the last years. How would kind of having an enterprise security browser in place help? Couple of answers on that. So first things first, we built, we call it an enterprise browser for a reason. If you think about many years ago, that, that phrase secure browser was already used. It was used by old things of the past and they were failures because the user experience was terrible and nobody wanted to use them. An enterprise browser, certainly at its core, makes sure that the user's safe and the browsing experience is safe. Um, number one is just, we when we build an enterprise browser, we build it from a, pers a perspective that assumes that the browser is installed on a device that you don't manage or you don't own. Think about it, a third party device, a BYOD. In that situation, I, I can't be 100% sure what that circumstance is, right? That's the scary nature of BYOD, for example. So we build the browser in a, in a way that it can live, you know, as safely as possible in those environments. Look, ignoring the fact that, you know, with the right time and resources, nation state type stuff, you know, that, you know, Nothing's impenetrable, but at the end of the day, we make the victory much more difficult um, than their, especially than their, their, their browsers they're using today. So things like protecting from extraction of content from the browser, protecting the cookies and the cache with encryption, or pr protecting against tampering events like man in the middle attacks or you know memory attacks, you know attaching debuggers and things along those lines. So we 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 do things to make the the browser itself a safe place to work. Secondarily, we keep the user safe. So when the user goes to a destination, you know what built-in mechanics for categorization and malware inspection, and even tied into third-party ecosystems. You know, a wonderful partner of ours has been CrowdStrike in the process. Being tied into that footprint of technologies, customers have made tremendous investments, not only in CrowdStrike, but many other things, but being able to be tied into the ecosystem has, has paid off dividends because customers don't have to throw away existing investment. They can leverage that existing investment to tie into the browser natively, but also then turn around and bring the browser out to that unmanaged real estate and extend their investment to that unmanaged landscape as well. So yeah. that's been a, been a really powerful set of, of, of capabilities to solve those problems for customers. Yeah, you mentioned customers, like there are a few other central competitors. Why are so many customers trusting you guys? Well, I think certainly we were fortunate enough the idea germinated here. So that gave us a lead technologically. So. For many years, we you know we, we did the unusual step of being in stealth for a, in a, in a, an unordinary an unordinary period of time. So it was a, a long stealth period, and uh, as a result, you know they gave us a chance to build something very special. We got a lot of advice from advisors and from customers, and we started selling the technology in stealth. So we were doing deployments in stealth, and what that gave us is the ability to start experiencing a live deployment. When you experience a live deployment, that's there's nothing like a lab will never live up to that. You see how users actually work. You see the, the things that practitioners deal with. And then you started adjusting the fine grained details. And as a result, now I'm starting to deploy in orgs. You know, I've got deployments in 650,000 user orgs, 250,000 user orgs. These are massive, massive organizations. What the result is, is that's the pressure testing. You live in that, 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 uh, that cooker that you know, makes sure the, the product continues to refine itself rapidly. And, and again, a four year window, we built a mature product that probably well beyond the period of time that it deserves and the maturity that it has. So um, but that has let it start living in some of the most demanding organizations on the planet as well. Mm -hmm. Obviously a big fund raise recently. I know you'll be going to quote, obviously you've got a great founding team, but you're gonna need other folks. When you're looking for your team, what are the sort of profiles and what's the sort of culture? Who would you be looking for for anyone interested in joining Ireland? Yeah, you know, first of all, when I look at anybody in the technical roles, you know, first of all, I, first thing I look for is technical skill. I look for diverse technical skills. That's one of the things about the browser too, is I'm not looking for one skill over here. You know, I don't need just proxy people, or people that are just work in cyber. People that are working things like application performance monitoring specialties or uh, technologies around digital user experience. Um, you know, people that work in virtual desktop infrastructure, delivering applications. There's a whole diverse set of skills that are very valuable for us because Technologically, the browser applies to so many things and can reduce so many of those things that are unnecessary overhead and you know unnecessary things in their the overhead in their environment. Um, but you know, I start with the technology, but certainly we look for people that have a cultural fit. You know, it is a fast-paced, fast-moving environment. You know, or your windows really short window to do so much, so it moves quickly. The world evolves quickly around us, and uh, well, the one thing we can count on is the user's eyes are still in the browser. And so, you know, that, that's been the case for 20 plus years at this point. 
continues being more and more the, the footprint where we deliver applications and it makes more and more sense for us. So technologically uh, speaking for the customer who adopts it, it's very simple. But for the practitioners that we hire in our teams, diverse skills matter a lot, but culturally it's, it's a fast moving environment. So people that are willing to do that, that's a, that's a fun thing for me. Yeah, lots happened in four years. Not the next four years, but what's what's the future? What's the future for you guys in Ireland? Yeah, it's um, you know the I you know I think it's important to think about where where the eyes spend their times every day. The time is spent in the browser all day long, and you know that's not one hundred percent of the usage today. Meaning people's eyes are in other places today, but more and more the eyes continue shifting to the browser as we continue to modernize the environments we work in. Uh, it is the uh, it's the place where you know you think of it as kind of the future desktop where people spend a lot of their time. And uh, so the ability to, to continue to expand in areas of, of digital user experience, can you t- continue to focus on uh, productivity for the end users? You know, there's, today there's many reasons why users want to use Island. When they, when, you know, there's always the initial skepticism, I'm so comfortable with Chrome or my Edge browser or whatever I'm using. And uh, when they see it, they, look, they immediately go, this is familiar, number one. Number two, then they start finding value in things that they're able to do that they couldn't do before. Like, Password manager, just a built-in password manager. Then my org doesn't have that. Now I have that, or the ability to use personal Gmail at work when you didn't have that before because the org was worried about data spilling over to personal Gmail. I don't have to worry about that. So the ability to free up the user, we continue to invest in a lot of those areas as well. Again, we the 100% focus. Job one is user experience right out of the gate. Mm-hmm. That makes the deployments go very smoothly. Uh, certainly makes the users want to adopt it and use it more effectively and gives the organization more value as well in the process. Talking of user experience, are you regularly getting feedback from the current customers to relate that to, to file up? Yeah, you know, I think that, that is probably win number one in the organization. We never train the end users. Like, it's crazy. You think about an org of 650,000 users, you don't have to teach one of the users how to use it because it's so familiar to the end users. So that is uh, that has been really wonderful for the deployments. A lot of organizational demand, a lot of work we're doing on you know, branding and making sure the organization can really custom fit it for their org, you know, kind of hand in glove fit uh, for branding and things along those lines. And again, make it the, the, the opportune workspace for the end user because we want to give them comfort. And a lot of times they're comfortable when they say company logo splash on the back screen of the browser and the company colors and things like that, the things that separate it and make it very, very clear you're working in a safe environment. Love it. Brayden, I wish you boys the best of success. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming on. Enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Brilliant. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed this very special RSA Conference 2024 edition. If you did, then please like, subscribe, and of course, share with your colleagues and friends. If you're a candidate looking for your next role or a hiring manager looking to build out your technical or go-to-market team, then please reach out to me directly on LinkedIn or via our email, info at aspronsearch.com.